Act 5, Scene 1, Warwickshire, upon the walls of the town of Coventry. Enter Warwick, wearing the red rose, the mayor of Coventry, and two messengers. Where is the post that came from Valiant Hawksford? How far hence is thy lord, mine honest fellow? By this at Dunsmore, marching hitherward. How far off is our brother Montague? Where is the post that came from Montague? Uh, by this at Dentry, with a puissant troop. Say, ah, uh, Somerville, what says my loving son? And by thy guess, how nigh is Clarence now? At Southam, I did leave him with his forces and to expect him here some two hours hence. And Clarence. And Clarence is at hand. I hear his drum. Oh, it is not here. It's not his, my lord. Here Southam lies. The drum your honor hears marches from Warwick. Who should that be? Be like unlooked for friends. Well, they are at hand, and you shall quickly know. Go, oh, trumpet to the walls, and sound a parley. See how the surly Warwick mans the wall. Oh, unbid spite. Is sportful Edward come? Where slept our scouts, or how are they seduced that we could hear no news of his repair? No, Warwick. Wilt thou ope the city gates, speak gentle words, and humbly bend thy knee? Call Edward king, and at his hands beg mercy, and he shall pardon thee these outrages. Nay, rather wilt thou draw thy forces hence, confess who set thee up and plucked thee down, call Warwick patron, and be penitent, and thou shalt still remain the Duke of York. I thought at least he would have said the king. Or did he mean to make a jest against his will? Is not a dukedom, sir, a goodly gift? I, by my faith, for a poor earl to give, I'll do thee service for so good a gift. Twas I that gave the kingdom to thy brother. Why then, tis mine, if but by Warwick's gift. Thou art no Atlas for so great a weight, and... Weakling, Warwick takes his gift again, and Henry is my king, Warwick his subject. But Warwick's king is Edward's prisoner. And, gallant Warwick, do but answer this. What is the body when the head is off? Alas, that Warwick had no more forecast, but whilst he thought to steal the single ten, the king was slyly fingered from the deck. You left poor Henry at the bishop's palace, and ten to one, you'll meet him in the tower. Tis even so, yet you are Warwick still. Come Warwick, take the time, kneel down, kneel down. Nay, when? Strike now or else the iron cools. I had rather chop this hand off at a blow, and with the other fling it at thy face, than bear so low a sail to strike to thee. Sail how thou canst, have wind, and tide thy friend. This hand, fast wound about thy coal black hair, shall, whilst thy head is warm and new cut off, right in the dust, this sentence with thy blood. Wind changing Warwick now can change no more. <laughs> oh, cheerful colors. Let's see where Oxford comes. Third, Oxford for Lancaster. The gates are open, let us enter too. So other foes may set upon our backs. Stand we in good array, for they no doubt will issue out again and bid us battle. If not, the city being but of small defense will quickly rouse the traitors in the same. Oh, welcome, Oxford, for we want thy help. Montague, Montague for Lancaster. Thou and thy brother both shall buy this treason, even with the dearest blood your bodies bear. 
The harder match, the greater victory. My mind presageth happy gain and conquest. Somerset! Somerset for Lancaster! Two of thy name, both dukes of Somerset, have sold their lives into the house of York, and thou shalt be the third if this sword hold. And lo, where George of Clarence sweeps along of force enough to bid his brother battle, with whom an upright zeal to right prevails more than the nature of a brother's love. Come, Clarence, come. Thou wilt, if Warwick call. Father of Warwick, know you what this means? Look, here I throw my infamy at thee. I will not ruinate my father's house, who gave his blood to lime the stones together and set up Lancaster. Why, trowest thou, Warwick, that Clarence is so harsh, so blunt, unnatural, to bend the fatal instruments of war against his brother and his lawful king? Perhaps thou wilt object to my holy oath. To keep that oath were more impiety than Jephthah when he sacrificed his daughter. I am so sorry for my trespass made that to deserve well at my brother's hands, I have proclaimed myself thy mortal foe with resolution. Wheresoe'er I meet thee, as I will meet thee, if thou stir abroad, to plague thee for thy foul misleading me. And so, proud-hearted Warwick, I defy thee, and to my brother, turn my blushing cheeks, pardon me, Edward, I will make amends. And Richard, do not frown upon my faults, for I will henceforth be no more unconstant. Now, welcome more and 10 times more beloved than if thou ever hadst deserved our hate. Welcome, good Clarence. This is brother-like. Oh, passing traitor perjured and unjust. What, Warwick, wilt thou leave the town and fight? Or shall we beat the stones about thine ears? Alas, I am not cooped here for defense. I will away towards Barnet presently and bid thee battle, Edward, if thou darest. Yes, Warwick, Edward dares and leads the way. Lords, to the field, St. George and victory! Act 5, Scene 2, A Battlefield Near Barnet. Enter King Edward, wearing the white rose, bringing forth a wounded Warwick, wearing the red rose. So, lie thou there. Die thou, and die our fear. For Warwick was a bug that feared us all. Now, Montague, sit fast. I seek for thee, that Warwick's bones may keep thine company. Ah, who is nigh? Come to me, friend or foe, and tell me who is victor, York or Warwick. <laughs> Why ask I that? My mangled body shows, my blood, my want of strength. My sick heart shows that I must yield my body to the earth, and by my fall, the conquest to my foe. Thus yields the cedar to the axe's edge, whose arms gave shelter to the princely eagle, under whose shade the ramping lion slept, whose top branch overpeered Jove's spreading tree and kept low shrubs from winter's powerful wind. These eyes, that now are dimmed with death's black veil, have been as piercing as the midday sun to search the secret treasons of the world. The wrinkles in my brows, now filled with blood, were likened off to kingly sepulchres. For who lived king but I could dig his grave? And who durst smile when Warwick bent his brow? Lo, now my glory smeared in dust and blood. My parks, my walks, my manners that I had, even now forsake me, 
and all my lands is nothing left me but my body's length. Why, what is pomp, rule, reign, but earth and dust, and live we how we can, yet die we must. A Warwick, Warwick, wert thou as we are, we might recover all our loss again. The queen from France hath brought a puissant power. Even now we heard the news. Oh, couldst thou fly? Why then, I would not fly. Oh, Montague, if thou be there, sweet brother, take my hand and with thy lips keep in my soul a while. Thou lovest me not for brother, if thou didst, thy tears would wash this cold, congealed blood that glues my lips and will not let me speak. Come quickly, Montague, or I am dead. Oh, Warwick, Montague hath breathed his last, and to the latest gasp try cried out for Warwick and said, commend me to my valiant brother. And more he would have said, and more he spoke which sounded like a cannon in a vault that might not be distinguished. But at last I well might hear delivered with a groan. Oh, farewell, Warwick. Sweet rest his soul. Fly, lords, and save yourselves, for Warwick bids you all farewell. To me in heaven. Away, away to meet the queen's great power. Act five, scene three, another part of the battlefield. <laughs> Enter King Edward in triumph with Richard, Clarence, and their army all wearing the white rose. Thus far our fortune keeps an upward course and we are graced with wreaths of victory. But in the midst of this bright shining day, I spy a black suspicious threatening cloud that will encounter with our glorious sun ere he attain his easeful western bed. I mean, my lords, those powers that the queen hath raised in Gallia have arrived our coast and, as we hear, march on to fight with us. A little gale will soon disperse that cloud and blow it to the source from whence it came. Thy very beams will dry those vapors up, for every cloud engenders not a storm. Queen is valued 30,000 strong, and Somerset with Oxford fled to her. If she have time to breathe, be well assured, her faction will be as strong as ours. We are advertised by our loving friends that they do hold their course toward Tewkesbury. We having now the best at Barnet Field will thither straight, for willingness rids way. And as we march, our strength will be augmented in every county as we go along. Strike up the drum, cry courage, and away! Act five, scene four, Gloucestershire, the plains near Tewkesbury. Enter Queen Margaret, young Prince Edward, Somerset, Oxford and their army, all wearing the red rose. Great lords, wise men ne'er sit and wail their loss, but cheerily seek how to redress their harms. What though the mast be blown overboard, the cable broke, the holding anchor lost, and half our soldiers swallowed in the flood, yet lives our pilot still. Is it meet that he should leave the helm and like a fearful lad with tearful eyes add water to the sea and give more strength to that which hath too much? Whilst in his moan, the ship splits on the rock which industry and courage might be saved? Ah, what a shame, ah, what a fault were this. 
Say Warwick was our anchor. What of that? And Montague, our topmast, what of him? Our slaughtered friends, the tackles, what of these? Why, is not Oxford here another anchor? And Somerset, another goodly mast. The friends of France, our shrouds and tacklings. And though unskillful, why not Ned and I? For once allowed the skillful pilot's charge, we will not from the helm to sit and weep, but keep our course, though the rough wind say no, from rocks and shelves that threaten us with rack, as good to chide the waves as speak them fair. And what is Edward but a ruthless sea? What Clarence but a quicksand of deceit? And Richard but a ragged fatal rock? All these the enemies to our poor bark? Say you can swim, alas, till but a while, tread on the sand. Why, there you quickly sink, bestride the rock. The tide will wash you off, or else you famish. There's a threefold death. This speaks I, lords, to let you understand. If some of you of us would fly from us, that there's no hope for mercy with the brothers, more than with ruthless waves, with sand and rocks. Why, courage then, what cannot be avoided toward childish weakness to lament or fear? Methinks a woman of this valiant spirit should, if a coward heard her speak these words, infuse his breast with magnanimity and make him naked foil a man at arms. I speak not this as doubting any here, for did I but suspect a fearful man, he should leave to go away betimes, lest in our need he might infect another, and make him of like spirit to himself. If any such be here, as God forbid, let him depart for before we need his help. Women and children, of so high a courage, and warriors faint? Why, poor perpetual shame! O brave young prince, thy famous grandfather doth live again in thee. Long mayst thou live to bear his image and renew his glories. And he that will not fight for such a hope, go home to bed. And like the owl by day, if he arise, be mocked and wondered at. Thanks, gentle Somerset, sweet Oxford, thanks. And take his thanks that yet have nothing else. Prepare you, lords, for Edward is at hand, ready to fight. Therefore be resolute. I thought no less. It is his policy to haste us fast to find us unprovided. But he's deceived. We are in readiness. This cheers my heart to see your forwardness. Here pitch our battle. Hence, we will not budge. Brave followers, yonder stands the thorny wood, which by the heaven's assistance and your strength must by the roots be hewn up yet ere night. I need not add more fuel to your fire, for well, I wot you blaze to burn them out. Give signal to the fight, and to it, lords. Lords, knights, and gentlemen, what I should say, my tears gainsay, for every word I speak, you see I drink the water of mine eye. Therefore, no more of this. Henry, your sovereign, is prisoner to the foe, his state usurped, his realm a slaughterhouse, his subjects slain, his statutes canceled, and his treasure spent. And yonder is the wolf that makes this spoil. You fight in justice. Then in God's name, lords, be valiant and give signal to the fight. <laughs> Act five, scene five, the battlefield outside Tewkesbury. 
Enter King Edward, Richard, and Clarence wearing the white roses, and to them as prisoners under guard, Queen Margaret, Oxford, and Somerset wearing the red roses. Now here a period of tumultuous broils. Away with Oxford to Hames Castle straight, for Somerset off with his guilty head. Go bear them hence, I will not hear them speak. For my part, I'll not trouble thee with words. Nor I, but stoop with patience to my fortune. Part we sadly to this troublous world, to meet with joy in sweet Jerusalem. This proclamation made that who finds Edward shall have a high reward, and he his life? It is. And lo, where youthful Edward comes. Bring forth the gallants. Let us hear him speak. What, can so young a thorn begin to prick? Edward, what satisfaction canst thou make for bearing arms, for stirring up my subjects, and all the trouble thou hast turned me to? Speak like a subject, proud, ambitious York. Suppose that I am now my father's mouth. Resign thy chair, and where I stand, kneel da thou, whilst I propose the selfsame words to thee, which, traitor, thou wouldst have me answer to. Ah, had thy father had been so resolved. That you might still have worn the petticoats and ne'er have stolen the breach from Lancaster. Let Aesop's fable in winter's night, his currish riddles sorts not with this place. By heaven, brat, I'll plague you for that word. Ah, thou wast born to be a plague to men. For God's sake, take away this captive scold. Nay, take away this scolding crip back, rather. Peace, willful boy, or I will charm your tongue. Untutored lad, thou art too malapert. I know my duty. You are all undutiful lascivious edward and thou perjured george and thou misshapen dick i tell you all i am your better traitors as you are and thou usurpest my father's right and mine take that the likeness of this railer here <gasps> sprawlest thou take that to end thy agony <gasps> and Theirs for twitting me with perjury. Oh, kill me too! Marry and shall. Hold, Richard, hold, for we have done too much. Why should she live to fill the world with words? What, doth she swoon? Use means for her recovery. Clarence. Excuse me to the king, my brother. I'll hence to London on a serious matter. Ere you come there, be sure to hear some news. What? What? The tower! The tower! <laughs> oh, Ned! Sweet Ned! Speak to thy mother, boy! Canst thou not speak? Oh, traitors! Murderers! They that stabbed Caesar shed no blood at all, did not offend, nor were not worthy blame. If this foul deed were by to equal it, he was a man, this in respect, a child! And men that ne'er spent their fury on a child! What's worse than murderer? May I name it? No. No, my heart shall burst if I speak. And I will speak so that my heart may burst. Butchers and villains, bloody cannibals. Oh, sweet a plant have you untimely cropped. You have no children, butchers! If you had, the thought of them would have stirred up remorse. But if you ever chance to have a child, 
Look at his youth to have him so cut off as death's men. You have read this sweet young prince. Play with her. Go bear her hence. Nay, never bear me hence. Dispatch me here. Here, sheath my sword. I'll pardon thee for thy death. What wilt thou not? And Clarence, do it thou. By heaven, I will not do thee so much ease. Good Clarence, do, sweet Clarence, do thou do it. Didst thou not hear me swear I would not do it? Aye, but thou usest to forswear thyself. Twas sin before, but now it is charity. What wilt thou not? Where is that devil's butcher, Richard? Hard favored Richard, Richard, where art thou? Thou art not here. Murder is thy alms deed. Petition is for blood. Thou ne'er puts back. Away, I say, I charge you bear her hence. So come to you and yours as to this prince. Where is Richard gone? To London, all in post, and as I guess, to make a bloody supper in the tower. He's sudden, if a thing comes in his head. Now march we hence, discharge the common swords with pay and thanks, and let's away to London and see our gentle queen how well she fares. But this I hope she hath a son for me. Act five, scene six, a room in the Tower of London. Enter King Henry the sixth, wearing the red rose, and Richard of Gloucester, wearing the white rose, at a lieutenant of the tower. Good day, my lord. What at your books so hard? I, my good lord, I, my lord, I should say rather, to sin to flatter, Good was a little better. Good Gloucester and good devil were alike, and both preposterous. <clears throat> uh, therefore not, good lord. Sirrah, leave us to ourselves. We must confirm. <sighs> so, flies the reckless shepherd from the wolf. So first the harmless sheep did yield his fleece, and next his throat unto the butcher's knife. What scene of death has Rossius now to act? Suspicion always haunts the guilty mind. The thief does fear each bush an officer. The bird that hath been limed in a bush with trembling weed wings misdoubteth every bush. And I, the hapless male to one sweet bird, have now the fatal object in my eye where my poor young was limed, was caught, and killed. Why, what a peevish fool was that of Crete that taught his son the office of a fowl, and yet for all his wings the fool was drowned. I, Daedalus, my poor boy Icarus, thy father, Minus, that denied our course. The sun that seared the wings of my sweet boy, thy brother Edward, and thyself the sea, whose envious gulf did swallow up his life. Kill me with thy weapon, not with words. My breast can better brook thy dagger's point than can my ears that tragic history. Wherefore dost thou come? Is't for my life? Think'st thou I am an executioner? A persecutor, I am sure thou art. If murdering innocence be executing, why then thou art an executioner. Thy son I killed for his presumption. <laughs> oh, hadst thou been killed when first thou didst presume, thou hadst not lived to kill a son of mine. 
And thus I prophesy that many a thousand which now mistrust no parcel of my fear, and many an old man sigh, and many a widow's, and many an orphan's water standing eye, men for their sons, wives for their husbands, orphans for their parents, timeless death shall rue the hour that ever thou was born. The owls shrieked at thy birth, an evil sign. The night crow cried, a boding, luckless time. Dogs howled, and hideous tempests shook down trees. The raven rooked her on the chimney top, and chattering pies and dismal discord sung. Thy mother felt more than a mother's pain, and yet brought forth less than a mother's hope. To wit, an indigested and deformed lump not like the fruit of such a goodly tree. <laughs> Teeth hadst thou, hadst thou in thy head when thou wast born to signify thou camest to bite the world. And if the rest be true, which I have heard, then thou camest... I'll hear no more. Die prophet in thy speech. <laughs> For this amongst the rest was I ordained. <laughs> and for much more slaughter after this. God, forgive me my sins and pardon thee. What? Will the aspiring blood of Lancaster sink into the ground? I thought it would have mounted. See how my sword weeps for the poor king's death. Oh, may such purple tears be always shed from those that wish the downfall of our house. If any spark of life be yet remaining, down, down to hell, and say I sent thee thither. <coughs> I that have neither pity love nor fear indeed tis true that henry told me of for i have often heard my mother say i came into the world with my legs forward had i not reason think you to make haste and seek their ruin that usurped our right the midwife the midwife wondered and the woman cried oh jesus bless us he was born with teeth and so I was, which plainly signified that I should snarl and bite and play the dog. Then, since the heavens have shaped my body so, let hell make crooked my mind to answer it. I have no brother. I am like no brother. And this word love, which gray beards call divine, be resident in men like one another, and not in me. I am always alone. Clarence, beware. Thou keep'st me from the light. But I will sort a pitchy day for thee, for I will buzz abroad such prophecies that Edward shall be fearful of his life, and then to purge his fear I'll be thy death. King Henry and the prince, his son, are gone. Clarence, thy turn is next, and then the rest, counting myself but bad till I be best. I'll throw thy body in another room, and triumph Henry in thy day of doom. <laughs> Act 5, Scene 7, London, the Royal Hall in the Palace. Enter King Edward, Queen Elizabeth, Clarence, Richard of Gloucester, Hastings, and a nurse carrying the infant Prince Edward. Once more we sit in England's royal throne, repurchased with the blood of enemies. What valiant foemen, like to autumn's corn, have we mowed down in tops of all their pride? Three dukes of Somerset, 
threefold renowned for hardy and undoubted champions. Two Cliffords, as the father and the son, and two Northumberlands, two braver men ne'er spurred their coursers at the trumpet's sound. With them, the two brave bears, Warwick and Montague, that in their chains fettered the kingly lion and made the forest tremble when they roared. Thus have we swept suspicion from our seat and made our footstool of security. Come hither, Bess, and let me kiss my boy. Young Ned, for thee, thine uncles and myself have in our armors watched the winter's night, went all afoot in summer's scalding heat, that thou mightst repossess the crown in peace. And of our labors, thou shalt reap the gain. I'll blast this harvest if your head were laid, for yet I am not looked on in the world. This shoulder was ordained so thick to heave, and heave it shall, some weight or break my back. Work thou the way, and that shalt execute. Clarence and Gloucester, love my lovely queen, and kiss your princely nephew, brothers both. The duty that I owe unto your majesty I seal upon the lips of this sweet babe. Thanks, noble Clarence. Worthy brother, thanks. And that I love the tree from whence thou sprangst, witness the loving kiss I give the fruit. To say the truth, so Judas kissed his master and cried, All hail, when as he meant all harm. Now am I seated as my soul delights, having my country's peace and brother's loves. What will your grace have done with Margaret? Renier, her father, to the king of France, hath pawned the sicils in Jerusalem, and hither have they sent it for her ransom. Away with her, and waft her hence to France. And now what rests but that we spend the time with stately triumphs, mirthful comic shows such as befits the pleasure of the court? Sound drums and trumpets. Farewell, sour annoy, for here I hope begins our lasting joy. Thank you for tuning in. We hope that you enjoyed Henry VI, part three. And let's welcome back our players. Jason Rennie, Chris Klein, Richard Conley, Taylor Marr, Christopher Carbo, Ron Dorn, Megan Wells, Dave Demke, Nima Rad, Mark Tracy, Emily Redman Hall, Julie Grossman, Elizabeth Juvenal, Nancy Pasquale, Spencer Frederick, Hadley Hulka, and I'm Mary Carrig. Join us next time for Richard III.